what they're doing, uh, what happened when COVID-19 originally hit, and then what they're doing now and what they've successfully done to pivot um, as a result. And so I'll just do a quick introduction and then I'll turn it over to each of the, uh, the uh, speakers to let them introduce themselves. But we have uh, Sunny Grovenveld from Zurich. Uh, she's an entrepreneur and uh, founder and managing director of Inspire 9 to 5. We have Noam, who is from our Tel Aviv program. He's a growth investor and he a, uh, owns a private holding group that acquires, develops, and resells businesses uh, using unconventional sales development uh, strategies uh, as the growth engine. Uh, we have Ryan Bethencourt, who's on my side of the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, Ryan is out here in California. He's the co-founder and CEO of Wild Earth, which is a plant-based uh, pet foods company. And he's a partner at Babel Ventures. And then last but not least, we have Fraser Doherty, who is uh, from the UK. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. He's the founder of Super Jam, um, which he actually started at age 14. So he got a, uh, an early start there. And he's the co-founder of Beer 52, which I'm sure everyone on the call uh, will be very interested to, to learn about. So uh, with that being said, I would love to, to let the mentors uh, introduce themselves and then also talk about the context of, of COVID-19 and what they did to successfully pivot. Um, we'll probably spend about 10 to 15 minutes kind of going over these, these anecdotal stories. And, uh, and then we want to get into the roundtable discussion. So again, if you have questions at any point during this webinar, please put them in the chat. We'd love to hear from you uh, and get your questions answered. And if you're working on a company, feel free to also introduce your company as well. So first up, uh, Sunny, maybe you want to start first and talk a little bit more about uh, what you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. Um, I mean, for those, Inspire 9 to 5 started um, seven years ago, and then three years ago, we launched a particular product which runs as a software as a service called Lunch Lottery. And I'm going to zoom in to that particular product because that's the one that really saw um, quite a change. Now, just briefly, Inspire 9 to 5 is a boutique consultancy based out of Zurich that works with uh, medium-sized and larger organizations across industries that um, want to change or shift their company culture. So we do a lot of uh, change management work, but very much focused on really how can we help companies that want to introduce new technologies into their organizations also make sure that they change their culture um, as, as alongside the technological change that they're seeking. So making organizations more collaborative, more flexible, um, that's very much where we, we support uh, companies. And one particular uh, challenge that companies have, particularly the larger ones, which, um, you know, Start out being started out being very hierarchical, um, and then realizing that the more collaboration um, they're looking for, the more they really need to become networked organizations. Um, and they they would often approach us and look for tools and ways to to be able to to on one hand um, use still the advantages of of having a hierarchy, but at the same time. Um, look for tools that would help them also become more of a network, better connected um, organization internally. And one particular tool that we developed for that was uh, a tool called Lunch Lottery. And Lunch Lottery is, is basically what it says um, in large organizations, like some might know from Switzerland, uh, Lint, uh, the chocolate. So uh, they, for example, use Lunch Lottery to match people uh, across uh, hierarchies and departments to meet for lunch uh, once a month. And, and this way they exchange ideas in an informal way and they sort of have a, a tool to introduce uh, serendipity into their organization. And uh, we've done this now for, for you know, something like uh, 20 uh, large, uh, often stock-listed organizations in Switzerland. Um, we also have a few clients in the US and uh, in, in other European countries. And this tool sort of overnight, obviously, as uh, COVID-19 sent everybody into home office, stopped working since nobody was going to be meeting anymore for lunch um, and so that uh, put us sort of in the situation where of course we needed to immediately uh, stop a lot of the matchmaking that was taking place um, through this tool and uh, then look at really with each single client and you know this was within two days we'd talked on the phone to every head of HR uh, personally and really checked in and, you know seen to what degree uh, were they willing to continue? To what degree were they looking to continue everything remotely and still have people be matched but uh, on a remote basis so that you have, uh, instead of uh, 
physical lunch meetings, you'd have virtual uh, lunch meetings. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, certain uh, organizations approached us. Uh, and one particular one I want to mention is the um, insurance company that the Europe-based uh, folks might uh, know, Generali. And uh, Generali provides a lot of different insurances. And uh, they were interested in repurposing the tool. And they said, well, you know, now that everybody is sort of socially distant, locked down at home, um, what is if we could turn this into an initiative where we um, use it more as a, as a marketing initiative for our clients. So the uh, CMO uh, came up to us and uh, asked whether it would be possible to run a marketing initiative that would allow, um, that would be called Heroes Against Loneliness. And it would allow anyone in Switzerland to sign up through a landing page. And um, on this uh, landing page, uh, we would collect uh, basically phone numbers and uh, email. Um, we would promise people not to do anything else with the data except for sending them uh, every three days a email uh, sharing a phone number of someone else who had signed up. Um, and in this way, uh, match make people for phone conversations across the country. And so um, Lunch Lottery suddenly became in Switzerland this, um, but basically the back end of this uh, major marketing initiative of this insurance company that was looking to um, break down some of the loneliness that a lot of people were experiencing. And we uh, ran this every three days it was really remarkable because I mean this company this insurance company is pretty big and um, they uh, the CEO signed off on this uh, initiative within uh, pretty much uh, 48 hours and he's like yes let's do it then we coded it um, because we needed to make sure that it would fit to their front end um, and uh, and then launched it with a press release and uh, and for those who don't know Switzerland has like three languages so we needed to have everything in German uh, French and Italian at the same time ready and we launched it um, within within uh, 72 hours, and then um, replicated that uh, three weeks later for the um, for Germany, for Generali Germany, for um, also Generali Austria, and uh, Generali France. So we ended up providing uh, this initiative, which we came up uh, with uh, during COVID-19, um, and thanks to this. Uh, the foresight of this, this insurance company um, and repurposed our, our sol original solution, which brings together people for lunch in large organizations to um, matching up uh, random um, people across uh, Switzerland and, and later also Germany, Austria and France for phone conversations to break down uh, the loneliness that a lot of people were experiencing. And I think it sort of had all these, these moments where you're like, wait a minute, like what is actually the important thing that we're doing with Lunch Lottery. And it's no longer about we're trying to break down uh, barriers in um, large hierarchical organizations. It's about bringing people together and connecting them in a very um, simple way um, and, and connecting the dots and, and, you know, enabling a little bit more serendipity than might happen uh, without it. And so that was, I think that was sort of our, our story where we, where we sort of rethought our value proposition and we also really realized that um that there's there's actually a lot more applications for this tool which previously having been born out of a uh, consulting business in the, the change management hr sector was was very targeted so i'm going to stop here but that's uh, an anecdote where i think there are a few lessons which we might be able to uh, dig in deeper later on amazing and you know just one kind of quick question for you and then no we'll move over to you so um, it sounds like it was a successful pivot, right? So if you had kind of told yourself maybe six months ago that, hey, we're no longer going to be able to meet in person, you're going to have to pivot it virtually. Like, do you think that your, your product is in a better position now than it would have been without COVID-19? I mean, I think just that if COVID-19 hadn't happened, we would have not thought about different application use cases because there are enough large hierarchical organizations in this world across industries for us to sell to and that's what we know best we understand how the hr function works we understand how to sell to this particular type of enterprise client and we really never looked at marketing um, as a potential avenue for um for applying this so i think had covid 19 not happened and had this cmo of generali not approached us i don't know if we would have you know maybe thought about this in two three years but we certainly wouldn't have seen this happen on our roadmap in 2020. amazing 
thanks for thanks for sharing. And again, if you have questions for Sunny, go ahead and pop it in the chat or for the other panelists. Um, Noam, why don't? Yeah. What about you? Why don't you go next? Okay. Well, it's, it's a pleasure. First, you know, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's a, it's an opportunity to share, and uh, always saying if you wanna if you wanna hear about all of my miserable mistakes and disasters, that's probably the best way to share that. Uh, but you know, by definition, if you go a little bit, you know, some of the people I recognize in the attendees list. So Anan, hello, how are you? I hope to see you here. He's a personal friend, and some other names, uh, Tom Hoffman as well. But um, um, you know, if I if I'm taking a look at my personal history, by definition, it's a mathematical equation. I had way, you know, way too uh, many failures than anything that was successful. So if you know, if you want to consult with me about how to found a company and how to make it successful, psh, by all means, go to another mentor, uh, or at least start with another one, and then you go come come to me when it comes to sales, come to me when it comes to growth, and and eventually, what I realized in the last few years, and this is a little bit, you know a little bit about what I do today, I actually purchase companies in bad shape which have good potential. And then when I realized that the function of sales and marketing, usually when it comes to sales and growth, the ability to really go big doesn't really work so well, then this is where we pop in. And then we simply make the company bigger, stronger. And then usually I just go ahead to the market and sell it back. And this is what I've been doing the last last years. I also, of course, invest in other channels, but this is the thing that I'm in favor of. Now, I always knew that in 2020 there will be a crisis, a global crisis. But you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to say I, you know, I predicted the COVID because I thought of something else. I thought of a financial crisis. I thought about the real estate change. I was into prop tech and thinking this could be something. And I even started a few things over there. But um, in terms of uh, uh, you know. Where do I want to take this forward? I realized that you know when COVID started, I realized I, I actually quite fast realized this is going to be big. This is going to take a while. This is going to change a bit the way we do business. But I, I'm sure that when it started, I didn't know how deep it's going to be. You know, I thought it's fine. Okay, it's like a ongoing flu, big one, very very large one, very violent one. My God, people are dying, so it's becoming serious. And at the same night, you know, when you're asking, when do, when do I understand I need to pivot? At the night when the Israeli prime minister was on the news telling everybody we need to stay at home. So now we are confined to our houses. And at the same time, the head of the treasury office said, you know, we're going to come up with a lot of, you know, goodies for the market, for the independent people, the, the entrepreneurs, the small businesses and so on. I pick up the phone to one of my partners telling him, listen, Here's an opportunity. I also realized that once everything's going to close down, I anticipated a drop at a certain business that was handling the financials of other, piece, other businesses. I anticipated a 60% drop. Don't ask me, you know, it wasn't, I didn't analyze anything. I wasn't in front of the Excel. It was, I think it was 9.30 p.m. I was in front of the TV. My kids were, you know, the small was still running around, making a lot of noise before going to bedtime. I was trying to hear what the, what the prime minister is saying. I understood it's going to be a 60% drop, and it was even a little bit more than that. So it took us a night to build a new service in which we tapped into government funds and helping our customers overcome this because they stopped paying, so no returners coming in. I couldn't afford paying employees. I couldn't afford paying for the for the uh, for the for the for the uh, uh, real estate we're staying at, for the offices and other services. So everything started to collapse. So we had little time to pivot on that. And I don't want to say it was an overnight success because it took three weeks of really hell. I was on the phone because I did what I know best, which is to sell. I was on the phone take, talking to the big companies, showing that we can help them do that. Eventually, after three weeks, we, we kind of pulled it off. So we saved the company. The company was alive. We, we managed to do everything. And, and from that point on, we actually realized that there is a new line of business that we can work. When previously, before COVID started, we always thought of, you know, ah, let's not do that. That's silly. That's not what we do. This is not us, you know, blah, blah, blah. All kinds of stories that were never backed up with anything substantial of doing. So 
not even testing the market or not even, sorry, not even doing any kind of earlier testing, same as Sunny, just jumping into the water. Just, you know, you, you, you moved from HR to marketing, so we moved immediately to something we didn't know anything about. And it worked, it worked very well. So besides the fact that we made substantial amounts of money, which is always good, you know, it's always, it's always good. It, let's, you know, let's imagine it's always good because in other areas we were losing money as well. So this is good, but we also understood that, you know, this is a really good opportunity. So we're stable, everything's good, we're actually growing, and this is very nice. So I'm gonna keep my two, three minutes, hopefully not too much, <laughs> not causing you too much trouble. And, you know, you can, we can go into details a bit later if someone wants. That sounds good. Yeah. And we can save it for the, the Q and a part. So, you know, just one really quick question and, and point to you. So there's always these like inflection points in an entrepreneur's um, progress when they're building a company where it's just, you have to sprint, right? Something happens, customer falls through. There's some kind of just, you know, big uh, monumental amount of work you just need to power through. And it's really amazing how much you can do, like you said, in, in one night, right? Just being motivated and, and understanding like, okay, there's this giant problem in front of us. We need to tackle it. Let's just like take the gloves off and, and move, you know, as fast as possible. And so um, to a certain extent, your speed and ability to, to react, which is, you know, arguably a startup entrepreneur's, you know, best resource, um, really helped you get through that. So that that's really amazing. Um, Ryan, so maybe, maybe next uh, we can go with you. Sounds good. Thank you, Ryan. Great name. <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, maybe I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on what it's like for a physical products company. So, you know, we, Wild Earth, we are a plant-based dog food company. We're a physical products company. Um, you know, before COVID-19, we were based uh, all office-based. I'm currently in the office. It's just myself and my chief of staff currently in-house and some essential functions that we have going on. Um, but it was actually my COO, I, you know, similar to Noam, I, you know, I was like, this is going to be like a bad flu, right? It was kind of like, this is a bad flu. I'm a, I'm a biologist. I've actually worked in drug development. I've actually worked in like developing uh, antivirals before. So I was like, I was like, uh, yeah, no, it's like going to be like a bad flu. And my COO was like, you are wrong. We got into this huge argument. And then he's like, you need to shut the company down now. We need to start now. We need to, da, 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 da. you are wrong, wrong. And I was like, you need to calm down because you're going crazy on me. And he's like, you're wrong. Um, and he was right. Right. And so, so like, this is, you know, he had to hammer it through my head uh, through multiple arguments. Um, and I thought he was just being paranoid. And I was like, okay, fine. We're going to be precautionary. We're going to get ready. Um, we started to get a plan together. It basically took us couple of days we leaned on people remember we were a fully office-based culture um i was anti-remote culture going into this I, I i don't think remote cultures work as well as as in office cultures uh life uh forced us to operate in a different way um and so so basically uh we actually had several team members who had actually worked remotely we actually have our chief veterinarian who's working remotely currently and uh Actually, our head of special projects, Steve, has, has always worked in remote companies. So we basically leaned on them for best practices. And we switched on um, kind of remote work practices. We did that within a couple of days. We, we got that ready on Thursday night. We reviewed it Friday morning at our on hands. We, we announced that we were going fully remote. Um, that afternoon, uh, the state of California announced that, they were, that we were going into full lockdown, right? So, so it was just, and that was something that, you know, I did not predict. I was like, okay, we've got a couple more weeks before we go into full lockdown. And so, you know, one of the big lessons that I learned is you have to listen to people, even if you disagree with them, right? I, I trust, I trusted my COO. That's why he's our, he's our COO. Um, and he had to bang it through my head that something really big was happening. And I was just, you know, I had, I don't know, an expert bias or something because I've worked in, in antiviral drug development previously. Um, and so uh, I was wrong. And so it was very humbling. But the good thing is because we are a team that embraces diversity and we argue things through, like if someone truly believes something, they argue it through. Um, we, we went fully remote, came with a whole bunch of challenges. A bunch of our computers started to fail uh, because they couldn't do video, including, by the way, mine. My, mine was a really old uh, Mac uh, and it just started to fail. And so we were in the middle of this remote thing and all of a sudden all of our computers start failing and that we have to figure out how to get access to new laptops to everyone when they're remote. Um, you know, a couple of weeks went by and we started to do really well. 
And so we changed everything about our culture. So we started to have 9 a.m. meetings to make sure everyone was doing well. Uh, we started to have like, we, we just changed everything about our culture. And what was super surprising to me is that seem, we seem to work better. And not only that, it appears that um, we can operate as a remote company, even though we have physical goods uh, that we produce. And, and you know, we manufacture in the Midwest, in the US. Um, we have sales and marketing throughout the US, throughout continental US. Um, we have warehouses. Uh, it was, it was, it's been a very interesting process to figure out how to really virtualize a physical goods company. We have tens of thousands of customers. And so, you know, first thing is, can the company function? The second thing was, okay, now that we're operating, what about our customers? What about our supply chain? Let's review our supply chain. Where are the holes? Um, where, where it kind of failed, actually surprisingly, was not our, our supply chain. So we were able to produce product. We were able to get it into our warehouses. We were able to get it distributed to our customers with our logistics company. It was Amazon. That was, that was, that was a company I did not expect to fail during the pandemic. And so what ended up happening was Amazon just went, uh, it, just, it just started to break. And they, they were unable to, to take in uh, physical goods that we were shipping to their warehouse. So, they, so we, would, we could get it to their warehouse, but they couldn't take it in. And so all of a sudden we had this problem that our Amazon customers, we have our direct to consumer customers on our website on wildearth.com. And we have our, our Amazon customers that buy on Amazon they couldn't get, we were stocking out, constantly stocking out. And so it just created new sets of problems um, for us that we tried our best to solve, but it was just, you know, we realized that, you know, we have to control our own destiny. And so um, we did see a huge spike in sales. That's what led to the stock out. Um, we saw a lot of like customer hoarding behavior. I was hoping this was the new normal uh, when we we're going up into it. And then all of a sudden people stopped and boom, <laughs> the other side of that hit, which was people had stopped. They no longer need to buy as much. And so now we need to push in sales during the pandemic and just figuring out how do you market to people during a pandemic? How do you sell to people during a pandemic? It's like, hey, sorry, you're locked at home, but don't forget your dog food, you know? So, so it was just, you know, it was, we had to be very, very sensitive. Um, we're a plant-based, uh, you know, dog food company. For us, you know, healthier products is a big focus. Um, you know, in this case, this pandemic was, you know, was linked with people eating uh, something, some type of animal. We don't know exactly, you know, whether it was bats or pangolins or something else. Um, we did not want to chime in on that message. We thought that it was, you know, this was a time where there's a lot of fear happening. Um, and so we really want to just provide support. And so we switched our marketing message to being comforting, positive, and very supportive during this tough time. And, and just saying that we're there for our customers, their families, uh, including their pets. And, uh, and you know, we, we managed to make it through uh, I was able to raise, it's not public, but I've been able to raise some additional capital. We'll be announcing that later. Uh, literally the hardest capital raise I've ever done. And I've done a lot of capital raises. Um, and then after that, I wear a different hat because I'm also a venture partner at Babel. And so then I started calling all of our founders uh, at Babel and making sure they were okay. And then helping them troubleshoot their businesses. So, so it's been a crazy ride. I think we're all getting ready for the new normal. This morning, I announced to our team um, that we're going to go remote. We're agreeing to go remote for the functions we can um, until until uh, Jan uh, until January first, twenty twenty one. Because there's just so much unknown in the marketplace. We want to give people, even though we don't have clarity, we want to give people our, our people as much clarity as possible. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. And you know, I know a lot of uh, employers had been nervous about the switch from you know in person culture versus remote, and so. You know, what, what would you tell yourself, you know, six months ago um, after having transitioned into this virtual work environment to, you know, Ryan, who might have been hesitant to do that in January? Uh, it can work. It can actually work. So, so one thing that we're considering doing now is we're, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to think about like, what are the new models of work? I don't think in-person work will go away forever. I don't think we're seeing the end of cities. Um, I think what we are seeing is we're seeing a change in the way we work. And actually this might open up opportunities for people in other metros and other regions. So, you know, we're currently looking at, do we set, set up a secondary hub on the East Coast so that we can actually have some flexibility because we know remote works. We still want a meeting hub for people to meet in, phys in, in like physical space if and when the vaccine comes or this blows through. And so we're really planning on the future. We're thinking the next year or two, what does our business look like in the next year or two, which is totally different to how we envisioned it prior to COVID, which is, you know, in person, one headquarters, everyone's here in house. Now we're really thinking, hmm, 
more distributed, a couple of hubs, depending on where the talent is, and, 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 and we stay flexible. We have remote plus physical location meeting places. So dr dramatically changed my worldview on how you can build businesses. That's great. That's great. So thank you for that. So uh, we'll move on to Fraser. So Fraser, if you could uh, share your, uh, your webcam and uh, why, don't, uh, why don't you jump in and, and tell us about uh, your pivot? Sure. Uh, well, nice to meet you, everyone. Um, my name is Fraser. I'm based in Edinburgh in Scotland. And um, I've actually put together a couple of little um, slides. I don't know if the, the host might need to accept um, sharing those. I can um, flick through a few, few images from uh, throughout my um, journey as an entrepreneur. Go ahead and then, yeah, I'll, I'll approve it um, once the message. Okay. Cool. Is that, that might work? Um, all right, there we go. Cool, thank you. Um, so yeah, my, my adventure as an entrepreneur started out as uh, a teenager. At the age of 14, I learned how to make jam in my grandmother's kitchen in Glasgow. I started making it as a hobby and selling it in the neighborhood and farmers markets and small shops. Um, it sort of grew and grew. Um, that's my beautiful grandmother there. And I came up with a way of making jam 100% from fruit and at the age of 17 managed to get my product into uh, Waitrose, one of the main supermarkets in the UK. And uh, since then it kind of launched in thousands more stores. Uh, we got a whole load of uh, press coverage along the way. Uh, my grandmother and I were invited to Buckingham Palace, uh, we were given a medal by Prince Charles, which was a, a very lovely day out for my gran. And um, my products have been selling in most of the major supermarkets in the UK. And uh, we also sell in places like South Korea, uh, which is probably our biggest market these days. And over there, I got the chance to take part in uh, TV home shopping show, um, which was a lot of fun. I got to sell my products live on Korean TV. Um, they explained that I had to do it in Korean, uh, which I made a terrible mess of, but uh, somehow somehow it worked. <laughs> um, more recently, we launched Super Jam in Japan. And when we did, my life story was made into a, a dramatized TV reenactment. Um, so this is a, a little uh, boy there playing my story in this uh, surreal Japanese TV drama um, and so that was my adventure with Super Jam um, over the course of about 15 years and uh, I'm still selling jam uh, but more recently I've been involved in starting a business called Beer 52 and Beer 52 is a craft beer club. And every month we visit a new country, uh, we try all the beers, <laughs> uh, we pick the best ones and we import them to the UK to share with our members. And for our community of beer lovers, it's really their hobby. They love discovering new beers every month. Uh, they get the chance to rate and review what we've sent them. Uh, we've got more than 180,000 people in our beer club, so it's the most popular beer club anywhere in the world. And um, pre-COVID, we promoted our club by uh, attending lots of beer festivals, producing special editions of our magazine to hand out to the attendees. Uh, every month, we uh, put together a magazine which is all about the beers that we've discovered, the breweries we've visited, and the countries that we've traveled to. So our business is very focused on uh, traveling around the world, and we've uh, visited breweries all around the Balkans, so that's like Bulgaria, Serbia, Croatia. Uh, we've been over to South Africa and um, explored not just the breweries, but the uh, society and um, you know, different things that people can do uh, if they go and visit there themselves. Uh, probably the, one of the most popular ones we did was a road trip around California. A lot of our uh, craft beer enthusiasts dream of uh, doing their own pilgrimage to California one day. So we got to live that for them and, and uh, share share all the a journey with them. Uh, more classic one was Oktoberfest, um, probably the most unusual place that we visited to uh, try beers was North Korea. Um, so we did a, a whole tour of uh, both South Korea and North Korea and uh, we were the first people to ever do a, a brewery tour there and we ended up creating a special 
beer, which um, raised money for uh, people living there. Um, so you can see that our business model is normally very based on uh, travel and the idea of going around the world to find these beers. And when coronavirus started, we obviously couldn't continue going to visit these breweries to discover their stories. So we realized that we needed to come up with a, a different way of doing it. And our solution was to launch uh, Cyberfest, uh, which was the world's first online beer festival. And the whole concept was that customers would buy uh, a ticket, which is a case of 12 beers, uh, which we delivered to their house, and then sent them a link to a YouTube live stream where uh, they watched along and at home uh, tasted the beers along with uh, tastings led by the breweries. And uh, we've run two festivals so far. Each of them had more than 10,000 people buying tickets. So for the breweries, this was a really great chance to sell their product at a time when they were really desperate for orders. And uh, we were able to help some of our brewery friends. And for our members, it was a really great chance to uh, lighten the mood uh, during lockdown and kind of get together in a, a safe way. And um, we broadcast four hours each night and our hosts, Rich and Doug, um, kind of entertained our members. And uh, each of the breweries kind of did a live tasting of their beers, did brewery tours of, of their breweries. And uh, for our members, it was really fascinating to get to visit breweries all around the world uh, from the comfort of their uh, sofa. Uh, we had some live music, uh, we had various uh, comedians, and all around a, a really great chance for our members to, to learn about beer. So we managed to turn a really negative situation for us into a really cool experience and a great way to kind of bring our community together and to support the breweries that we work with. Um, as part of that, we also launched Cyber Alley, uh, which is a series of online bars. And uh, it's um, beer52.bar. And uh, basically in there, we uh, invited our members to go and meet each other and hang out. We've got about 12 different themed rooms in there uh, based around different styles of beer. And it's basically a video chat uh, through a, a system called Whereby. And um, especially on the nights of our beer festivals, they love to uh, sit there into the small hours of the morning drinking beer together. And um, this was a great chance for people to make some new friends and, and have a laugh. And um, we plan to have the next Cyberfest at the end of August. Um, so we're very much looking forward to, um, uh, yeah, continuing this, uh, this concept. And so that's, that's more or less, uh, more or less my story. I'll stop sharing my screen. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I love the concept of a, a virtual bar. And I think like, you know, from what we're seeing, one of the big things that we've done at Founder Institute is uh, we like connecting our founders and our mentors and create these social gatherings. And, and so that's a big part of the, the program. And so it's like, how do you do that efficiently? How do you make it fun? So it's not just, you know, your hundredth Zoom call of the day, you know, that you do at 6 p.m. Or, or, you know, what have you. So um, socializing over Zoom in this new virtual world is, is a very hot topic right now. And, you know, we've tested lots of different programs. So, so thank you for sharing, Fraser. So let's jump right into the, uh, the Q&A part of this. So some of you have submitted some questions. Um, I'll just kind of take it from the top here. Um, so this question is for you, Noam. Uh, have you discovered any good business development um, or customer development strategies to get in front of customers in this new virtual world? Um, well, yes, definitely. Well, to be honest, it, we didn't have any choice. So, you know, if I'm taking a look at current business today, the pro I think the problem is the distance. Um, you know, and again, for me personally, if I go way, well, if I go back, my my entire business ability when it comes to selling is is my ability to be in front of people and i'm sure that the other founders here as well as the attendees you know you can you can relate to that you know there's not nothing 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 exchanged the fact that you're sitting in front of a person you sit face to face we we you know you're looking in the, the, the people's eyes you can measure what's going on you can you can you know can pivot your conversation oh i did something wrong i need to fix that and so on and so forth so suddenly we being in front of a zoom screen 
locked in your home, suddenly the business environment is changing, you're, you're kind of, you know, all, all the little jokes about wearing only a nice uh, t-shirt. And look what's going on today. Everybody is now mis, mis, uh, um, you know, misbehaving and, and wearing whatever they want. And it's wonderful because here in Tel Aviv, this is where we dress. So it's, it's really nice what's going on. But in terms of the challenge, suddenly things are changed. So I, I wouldn't call it that, you know, that the business, the, the models have changed because no, I think the tactics have changed. It's the little things. And I think that people are growing into this. So suddenly it's, hey, it's completely okay to run into a cold call. It's completely okay to, 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 let's take it on Zoom. It's completely okay to book even a significant deal on this one. It's completely okay to go on top of something. It's completely, it's turning to be okay. And I think it's happening because people realize that, you know, we don't have any other way. It's actually, this is the way things are gonna be. And I think, the, the, you know, as, as we move forward, we realize it's okay, so suddenly it's fine to make little mistakes. It's fine to be not on top of everything. It's fine not to be, you know, completely dressed up. It's fine to make little, you know, mistakes verbally. It's, it's fine. And we're all human. And suddenly we see all the people we track, Robin Sharma, Simon Sinek, everybody's talking from their homes and you can see that, the, the, you know, the home at the background. This is, this is not a work study, guys. This is another room at the home at home that we have converted into a, some kind of an office. So sometimes my wife is here, her mother is here when you have to take up the kids and everybody's working from the same space. It's not a co it's not a co uh, working space. It's a big mess space. But it's fine. So if you're talking about, you know, what we've discovering, I'm discovering that it's even becoming much more easier. It's speedy, it's fast. Same as we discussed, you know, pivoting it, throughout the night and the next morning, you have new deals coming in. So I say this as a wonderful period. I see that we're coming back to our roots, back to simplicity, back to turning things into simple, faster, quicker, and better. And, and you, know, you know, hearing the Beer 52 story, you know, this is a, an amazing, an amazing, an amazing story. Besides the fact that I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of beer, and if I would stand up, you would see my beer belly, so you would believe me. And, and I'm a permanent, you know, visitor in, in Oktoberfest. And now it's not Oktoberfest. There's not a, it's going to be different. So I think it's a great opportunity and a great time. Although it's some kind of even a sad period when it comes to be completely, you know, apart from other people. Are there any tactics that maybe work better in the virtual environment? Or like, have you switched like kind of the mix so like maybe before it was more like email to set up a call to then get on the call. Are you doing more cold calling? Like what, is that, what does that typically look like for you? Well, first of all, if I'm taking a look across in my businesses, I, I, I wouldn't say that this represents the entire industry, but I think it does reflect on something, is the fact that there's more cold calling. There's, you could say, more courage, if I may say, you know, before that people were feeling uncomfortable going cold calling just popping in front of someone else, I think that I can see that there is a difference. Um, and when it comes to decide quicker for both parties, is there, is there a real substantial offer here for our customer? Are we bringing any value? I think that the decision-making process internally qualifying the opportunities when it comes to you know, selling methodologies, I see that things are happening faster. And it's okay to decide fast and it's okay to say, I don't see any business here. I don't think, sir, I'm going to bring any value to you with this. Let's just drop the call and that's it. And if I may say another thing, you, we can also go into this a little bit later. You also manipulate using the web. You know, think of it this way. When you're in the room with a lot of people and you control the conversation, you have to use different, I would say, behaviors when you're in front of people by doing it on Zoom, when you control the mic of everybody, you can jump into a conversation, you can use even technological stuff that are in your favor to control the conversation, to get it forward. So, you know, it's a different environment, but you can take advantage of it. It all depends on how quick you are and how, you know, courageous you are with just trying it out. That's it. Awesome. And I'd love to open it up to the other panelists as well. Has anyone tried any new business development tactics that, that you have found to be particularly effective at, during this time? Well, 
Well, one marketing channel that we we had tried it before but uh, had limited success uh, was direct mail. So sending sending mail to people's homes, um, and maybe partly because everyone is at home these days, uh, it seems to work a lot better than uh, ever did before. So um, that's a kind of old school one for you. Yeah, I, I have I have one actually, Ryan, which which I think is very interesting during this time. We sent out to 3,000 of our customers, we sent out a survey. There was nothing attached to it. It's just like, hey, uh, could you tell us more about yourselves? Like, that's it. And the data that we got back from that was phenomenal. Like, we, we basically asked them, like, who are you? Where are you? Uh, you're feeding your dog wild earth. We think that it's great. Have you seen any benefits? Have you seen any health benefits to, to your dog? And, and we got a ton of data back, like data that we can actually use for marketing material, like statistically significant data, 425 of those 3,000 people got back to us. Um, this was in the early part of the pandemic when everyone was in lockdown, staying at home. So now's a great time. Uh, the way we distribute it was by email. So because we're a direct consumer company, we just emailed our customers. And the, you know, there was no incentive other than like, hey, we love you. We love that you are a customer. Um, we love your feedback. And, and people actually filled out these really long surveys just because they like Wild Earth, right? That's it. Uh, and they're a customer and they like our products. And so um, that was actually a huge learning for me. I, I didn't think people would do that. Um, and uh, I got some advice from another founder who basically, she told me, she was like, look, send people an email. What's the worst that's gonna happen? They won't respond. That's it. And maybe they might. And, and it turns out a lot responded. Um, and so I would definitely recommend for those of you that have direct to consumer businesses or, or where you have the email addresses of your customers, send them a really respectful email to saying, Hey, we'd love to learn more about you. Like, I don't know, new products. What would you like? Like, what well, you know, in these times, I think there were a lot of questions around pivots, ask your customers questions, talk to your customers. Like those are the people that are going to help you find your path, like going forward. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think there's what I'm seeing is there's some hesitation, I think from, from founders, um, to send out those emails because they're like, oh, everyone's like hosting a webinar these days. Everyone's out there sending out, you know, emails. And so it's almost like they kind of talk themselves down from, from actually doing it. But at the end of the day, and, and your company is a prime example, right? People love their, their dogs. They love their animals, right? They love making them healthy and giving them things that are beneficial. So therefore they use your product and you can almost assume that they love you, but yeah. everyone's customer should love them. Yes. Right, that's why they're a yeah. customer. And so yeah. therefore, like, if you're not doing something that someone loves you for, then you might be doing the wrong thing and you can use that data to then pivot and make something that someone loves. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting point because that's really how you can break through the noise. Yeah. yeah. There's still uh, one thing that I, I can add, um, not from a company that I personally founded, but uh, from a company where I'm on the board, um, their communications agency, Jung von Matt Limmat. And what they did, um, Ryan, you just mentioned talking to your customer and what they did is they did, they put on their website a little, um, a little sort of extra blog during COVID-19. They said, hey, um, we want to talk about opportunities. So we want to, um, they offered something that they called the opportunity call, like book a free opportunity call. And our communications team is going to like sit with you for 30 minutes, I believe it was um, for free. You can talk about whatever you want. And, um, you know, we'll give you our communication advice on that. And, you know, if you if, if that is useful to you, like crisis communication, whatever, great. Um, if we find a way to work together out of that, phenomenal. If not, and we just, you know, check in on each other, that's cool too. And I think that sort of becoming accessible and being like, hey, we're all trying to figure this out was a nice way for them to signal we want to keep talking. We are not going to say that we have all the answers. We don't but we definitely have some know-how and would be happy to provide some of that in you know, a 30 minute call free of charge. I love that. And, and Ryan, maybe just add one more thing that I think all founders would definitely benefit. Make yourself accessible. Just like Sunny was saying, uh, our customers can email me at any point in time, right? Ryan at wildearth.com. That's, and that goes directly to me. Like sometimes they'll email me, like, is this really you? And it's like, yes, it's me. Thank you so much for being a customer. And then we start talking, right? And then sometimes they'll be like, hey, my dog didn't like the dog food. And it's like, okay, well, did you transition correctly? Oh, no, I didn't. Okay, well, then let's, you know, and then I, I get other people involved within the company to help them, like our chief vet or something else. So it keeps it very real because if someone's not happy with something that you did, it's like the bag shipped and it spilt. And I had this bag that was open when it arrived in the box. And it's like, well, I'm really sorry about that. 
and then we go and fix it, right? So, so it just keeps you very close to your customer. Yeah, amazing. Some, sometimes the most critical feedback is the most valuable. And so if you can kind of keep a bead on the front line of like what's happening, uh, as you mentioned, then, then it puts you at a very good advantage. Um, so let's, let's move on to uh, some other questions here. Um, you know, from David, uh, he says that I would love to learn more from all the panelists, especially the gentlemen in the physical goods space, Ryan and Fraser. What is the biggest challenge you faced uh, and continue to face transitioning to all remote work? What presents the biggest bottleneck for you? So you probably have warehouses, you have, phys you know, a lot of the work that you do, like might be need to be physical. So what are, what are the still the biggest challenges of remote work? Fraser, you want to go first? Sorry, did you ask me what, what are the, sorry, was that, was that directed to me? I didn't quite catch. Yeah, it was directed to you and to, to Ryan. So what, what are the biggest challenges that you face transitioning to all remote work? Um, well, we still have a team who work in the in the warehouse packing the orders. Um, so we had to we had to do some work to make sure that that was safe and um, that everyone could stay a couple of meters apart and uh, knew what to do to uh, yeah to, to be safe and, and things like that. Um, and then the rest of our team, customer service and everything else, is working remotely. And we've hired about. Um, 25 people during this lockdown period um so we've never actually met them uh, hopefully they turn out to be uh, all right when we do all meet but uh yeah that, that's been a, a a pretty um yeah pretty cool experience to know that you can uh meet people over zoom or whatever and uh, trust them and uh think they can work out what to do so yeah that's been uh, I've been amazed actually at how, how smoothly it's gone. What about you, Ryan? Yeah, the, the biggest challenge has actually been uh, uh, new products. So, so we, you know, we currently have five products on the market. We're actually launching another three new products and we're working on some of these are supplements like dog supplements. Um, and we were working on new formulations of our dog food. So we really wanted to add new flavors and new, new varieties of our dog food. Um, when the lockdown came, that basically stopped us because we work with our co-manufacturers and so we couldn't go into the factories. And so we're still having issues with that where we're basically kind of frozen for new product development outside of the products we essentially had already developed prior to COVID-19. And so we're now coming up with new systems and new processes to continue with our new product development um, in, in a physical manufacturing space. And that's, that's a challenge. So um, prototyping is pretty easy because that's something we can do locally um, when you're prototyping at a commercial scale, you, you require like essentially industrial machinery to, to make sure your product comes out right, to make sure the quality is right, the QA process, that's really challenging right now. So I think a lot of companies are going through that transition um, and, and trying to figure out how they can actually develop new commercially scalable products and test them um, in a safe fashion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, one of the challenges that I've seen from, from various companies that are, you know, similar in this physical good space is even just keeping up with regulations, right? Because like there wasn't a whole lot of guidance in the beginning and, and you know, the, the regulations are changing pretty frequently. And so, uh, you know, an example is, you know, outside of Founder Institute, I have a security company and one of our clients is a big coffee distributor. And they just kind of, you know, when this was all going down, they asked, you know, do you have someone that can stand in front of our, our uh, distribution facility and take the temperature of our employees? And I said, yeah, sure, we could do that. <laughs> you know, easy, easier to do that than, than some other things. And so like, there's a lot of things that are changing. Like some companies are requiring you to actually like take temperatures of employees who handle food items. And so there's just so many, so many different regulations and it's changing all the time that it can be a challenge to keep up with it um, and adapt your, your, uh, your plans and strategies to them. Super interesting. Super interesting. So um, another question here. Uh, so this is from Abdullah. What are the best ways to construct a plan and evaluate whether the pivot is worth it? So so when you guys at late at night, you know, all this was going down, you're you're thinking about okay, should to pivot or not to pivot? What what did you have a framework that you used? How did you evaluate evaluate those plans? This is to everyone on the panel. 
I mean, I can say something to that because I guess uh, with us, it was really like there's a customer request. How much time is it going to take us to do it? You know, what, um, what, what, what does that mean in terms of like how we need to coordinate with them? Uh, and then, you know, the moment we heard uh, the CEO of the company was behind it and he had given his OK, um, the, the insurance company, um, we were like, great, like that's an amazing stakeholder to like have him be excited about, you know, what we could potentially do together. Let's go. And really, um, there was very little, uh, you know, framework and thinking about it and, and should we or should we not? It was really like customer need identified. All right. Like, you know, what can we do to like deliver within by the end of the week? And, and you know, amazingly, somehow it, it really worked. We set up a basically, a, a, you know, this goes sort of, and I mean, I work with a lot of corporates and corporates tend to take months to get you you know through the compliance and and all of this and i mean the fact that like someone was willing to say you know at the very top level yes let's do it um you know the next thing we knew they had the our, the marketing team of the insurance company and, and they're not known to be particularly fast i mean you know insurance companies are, are oftentimes um slow and they can take their time and and, and so on and, and they set up a whatsapp group like there was you know 50 percent of the marketing team was on the group like our cto and and our biz dev and salespeople were on the group. Um, we had someone on communications team on the group to do to figure out how to do the whole communication press release. It was literally a WhatsApp channel, um, which I also I'm not sure if that is you know like conform or not in terms of their data policy um, and exchanging information of how to make this project happen. But whatever, I mean, we just needed to get it done, and it was really like full on startup mode, which I thought was remarkable considering that, you know, this is a, I think, I believe a hundred year plus old um, insurance company. So I, I think it was really like, let's just go for it. And it was, th the interesting thing was like, you know, that's very common within sort of the startup world where like, you know, two founders are having a beer idea and we're like, all right, let's, you know, let's slap up like a landing page and see how many emails we can like gather to uh, validate this idea. And in this particular case, that same spirit happened in a very corporate environment and i think that is that is um, quite remarkable and i think whenever you do see that kind of opportunity knock on your door if you work with corporate or enterprise clients like basically like just run and take it um would be my piece of advice um that i that i'd uh, yeah that i'd take with that any other panelists uh well i, I can um I can, I can be all in favor of just jumping into the water, as Sunny said, and I think that all of the founders here and the, on the panelists are very good with, with jumping into cold waters. Deep, dark, un, unknown, for me, un, unknown territory. And I think that's wonderful that, you know, this is something that I learned to value, although it can turn to be a mistake. But one thing I understood, and maybe, maybe this is a good answer to, for Abdullah, um, although it, takes a night to realize that you need to pivot and although you need to recruit or maybe train people and my god it's amazing to see that sometimes employees understand that there is a problem but it takes them time to adjust but on the same time your co-partners or co-founders are most probably the best you could say count to wait system that you can use so it took me many years to understand that the person I need to work with is not someone who is very similar to me, but completely at the, at the opposite. Someone, you know, if I'm, okay, everybody realized I'm a risk taker and that goes all the way from my military years. I know how to operate and work in very unconventional environments, not understanding the, the completely what's going on. And possibly that makes me a dumber animal. So I need someone who is sophisticated, a financial officer, that can be on the other side, tell me, listen, we're going to go down with your system. So for Abdullah, I would say, go with your courage on the same time, use a counterweight. So we were using, you know, brain material to think what we should do now, understand customer needs. On the same time, we were corresponding over Google Docs, Google Sheets, trying to understand. So there's new regulation coming in. What would that be? What would had this be an effect? So we're changing the system again again and again and again so working analytical on the same time trying new things on the same time it's a very chaotic environment but it's also very very um powerful and empowering system to do because you're trying to measure your moves but on the same time taking action without stopping so for abdullah i would say calculate 
and run with the calculator as you do it. That's the, <laughs> that's the best like, suggestion I can make. And you will realize that suddenly this happened to us. We forgot to calculate the column. We forgot to include it. And the results were even better because we didn't consider something. Just for the sake, just to show that, to show that sometimes calculation is not that good. Yeah, I mean, you know, kind of going back to your, your military reference. So, I mean, you could use the OODA loop, right? Observe, orient, decide, act. And I mean, like, if you look at your job as a founder, right, you're balancing risk. And, um, you know, if you look at the lean startup methodology and, you know, testing your assumptions, your, your main job right now is to test your riskiest assumptions. And so you're going to continue repeating this cycle of, you know, coming up with a theory or hypothesis, hypothesis like, okay, we're going to make the program virtual. Well, let's do a test and see if it works. So then you test it, you gather data, and then you use that data to make a data-driven decision. Right. And, you know, an example is you know, when this first started, um, a city here in the U.S. and in, in uh, the, the Northwest is called Seattle. Um, and it was one of the first kind of COVID um, strongholds, I would say, where, where it started affecting the region. And we had to uh, we had to make the program virtual. And so we were unsure if it was going to work. We we're kind of looking at this thing globally, like, you know, how would we take 200 programs that are all live and turn it into a virtual program? And so we used Seattle as a test. We kind of created a framework. We gathered data. We interviewed the founders. And it turned out to be successful. So then we started doing a couple other virtual programs. And it turns out that it actually was a really good decision. And it helped us by, by gathering that data and, and using it to make the decision. That's really like where, where you can be more confident in, in balancing that risk. Um, so you can go ahead and use, use a framework similar to that. So, you know, I know we're at time here, um, and I want to be respectful of all the mentors and, and the founders. So, you know, before we jump off here, because um, there are other questions, I just want to thank the panelists for joining us today. Um, and thank you to the attendees. So if you're a, a founder uh, who's interested in uh, launching a company, Founder Institute has many different programs all over the world. Chances are you have a local program in whatever city you live in. Um, we have a special program that's going to be operating between Zurich, uh, Switzerland, Israel, Tel Aviv, and Silicon Valley. And so this is one of the first programs where we're launching this concurrent strategy. So if you want to get expert advice, similar to the advice that the mentors today were, were sharing with you, um, we're here to help launch meaningful and enduring companies. And we've got a really great program coming up in, in the fall. Uh, so we'll go ahead and send a couple follow-up emails to you if you're interested in learning more. You can also jump on uh, webinars. We seem to be running you know, probably somewhere around 20 to 30 webinars a week across all of our different cities. So uh, it's, uh, it's a busy time for us, but things are going well. And uh, I, I just wanna say um, thank you to the panelists again for joining. Uh, what we'll do is we'll send a follow-up with other information, and uh, I really look forward to, uh, to hearing more from the founders about the companies they're working on and working with you through the program. So thank you again, panelists. It's been a pleasure, and we look forward to the next one. Take good care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Great job. Thanks very much. Great day.